1999 Tarmac champion and Cork winner for the last two years, Ian Greer, is going for the treble in a corking new Corolla. The particular part of the world that the World Rally Cars will race through in the first day of the area for an MDD supported event is in the Mitchellstown area. Eight stages are to be tackled in typical autumnal weather where you can experience four seasons in one day. A tire choice nightmare. Welcome aboard Ian's new Taranta de Paul Toyota, a state-of-the-art World Rally Car Corolla fitted with a Lexus-devised engine and all the sequential gearbox and electronic transmission technology. It's a steep learning curve for the Hillsborough champion as Ian and Dean Beckett settle into their new office. Two stages done, Alan, and uh, I think we're three seconds off the first place mark. So I think we've more to come, and uh, the boys are going to do a bit more adjustment to the suspension, and uh, uh, the seat is not sitting right for me either. So we've a lot of wee improvements to make, and we'll see what happens. For Andrew Nesbitt and James O'Brien, Cork is a victory parade with the championship already in the bag. But Andrew feels he still has something to prove in the Cuisine de France car, as the perception is that the 2000 title has come easy to the Armagh driver. We went out to set a pace this morning, uh, it's obviously international rallies we're at here today, and coming from the Manx we want to see what the pace was going to be like, and the uh, pace is now set for the rest of the day and tomorrow, so... Um, it's going to be quick. Austin McHale has borrowed co-driver Joe Danny for the event and the Dublin pair are having a miserable start. I don't know where we are, Plum. We've lost roughly, say, a minute, maybe a minute and a quarter there, or a bunch of quarters of a minute, about 40 seconds, the first two stages with the slip and clutch. And it's a new clutch just put in the car. And, uh, you know, I just noticed this morning, the start of the first stage off the line, when I dropped the clutch, it just started to slip. But uh, they're trying to do something with it now at the moment. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Bad news for Austin, but good news for Frank Maher and Dermot O'Gorman as they settle into the new Focus. Frank is third fastest on both the opening tests in the McCabe Tow Bar's backed supercar. You've come from a World Rally Car Escort to a World Rally Car Focus. Big difference? Huge difference in every respect. I mean, the power, the handling, the stability of going around the bends. I mean, you're just up another 10-15% in every respect, but you just have to drive and have the confidence to do that. Kenny McKinstry looks confident, but he's having difficulty adapting to the left-hand drive. And he's a little upset having clipped a cat on the second stage. Let's hope it wasn't a black one. Donald O'Donovan and Mickey Morrissey are fastest of the Group A cars in their OKI Celica. Followed by Frank O'Mahony and Hugh McPhillips in the AA class in the Dennis and Mary Ryan Impreza. Sean McArdle and Pat McCann are worried about a flickering oil pressure light in their Celica. And John O'Sullivan and Pat Cashman's main aim this weekend is the Southern Four Rally Championship. But there's a sensation after two tests, Mal McShay and Michael Orr have their 1600cc Citroen Saxo kit car in seventh place overall. In fact, they had been sixth after the first stage, but as we know, a Saxo is notoriously fragile. Well, it's a terrible thing to say, but it's usually a good idea to interview you earlier on in a row. <laughs> you could be right there, Plum. Um... As always, the, the rally starts out very good, so I'm the fingers are crossed for this one, Plum. We're hoping it all goes well. So. After the Mitchells time service, it's back to the action. The and Andrew place. drops a further two seconds to Greer on stage three, complaining of a water injection problem in the Impreza. However, on stage four, he really gets the hammer down to push the gap out to nine seconds. Andrew is a joy to watch. He's had more time in his world rally car than any of his rivals, and it shows as the new champion confidently glides his Pirelli shod projectile over the treacherously slippy Marshallstown test. 
by the end of the second loop, the Subaru Island car is 20 seconds out in front. But it's not the Toyota that's now chasing, it's the Ford. We're flat in sixth in Ian Greer's Corolla. That's at least 120 miles an hour. Ian shares fastest time on stage three with Johnny O'Sullivan. A good showing again for Greer and an excellent time for the Killarney driver. Narrows. 100. Quick left. 200. The Toyota is just one second off the lead. Enjoy this high-speed ride with Dean calling the notes. Watch that gear indication readout between the spokes of the steering wheel. Into a narrow medium left over crest. Caution, medium right through bridge. Caution, K left, narrow prow. Square right, caution, slippy. The fairy tale start comes to an end before stage five. The Toronto DePaul team incur a 15 second road penalty. And one of their new rims wouldn't go onto the hub during a tire change. It drops them to third. Jump dip. Jump 80, straight brow, 100, over finish. The Ford now moves up to second. Frank's had two second fastest times in a row. On a notoriously tricky Marshallstown stage, equipped with wet weather tyres, he goes one better to top the timesheets. No wonder they're dancing in Tipperary. Remember, this is only Frank's fifth stage in the Martin Wilson built car. Thankfully, the clutch now seems to be biting in the McHale World Rally Car Toyota. Note the contrast between Austin's right-hand drive Corolla and Ian's later left-hand drive model. Slight right, 150. Slight left, 70. Never say die McHale is having another of his classic fight-back drives. But Austin is really having to fight to keep the car on the road. And the root cause of the long-term handling problems in the aircom net car will at last become evident later in the event. But despite these problems, Austin's determination has brought him right back into fourth place after five stages. And we can see just how tricky that Marshallstown stage is from inside the Corolla. Donald O'Donovan continues to impress, and the Dunmanway driver has moved ahead of McKinstry into fifth place. Kenny is getting some first-hand knowledge of his latest addition to his hire fleet, the car previously owned by the Russian rally champion. McShay continues to set sensational times. The Fermanagh driver brings the phrase commitment up to a new plane. Frank O'Mahony will slip from 8th to 9th after a brief off-road excursion on stage 5. And John Dempsey loses 5 minutes on the same stage. Here's O'Sullivan who shared that fastest time with Maher on stage 3. But his WRC escort now has a slipping clutch. Tipperary driver Roy White is dominating the Mitsubishi dominated Group N category. Seamus Heron has had a cautious start and this slide on stage five doesn't improve his case. Jerry McVeigh was another slow starter, but he's been rapidly closing down Roy White's lead until the Marshalls Town stage proved to be the graveyard of the Tyrone driver's hopes. And I literally mean the graveyard. As Bernard Crowley's pictures show. Um, whenever the wall was coming at you, you just brace yourself and hope that it doesn't stay there, hope that it gives, and it did. So we're very lucky. So thanks. There are three stages left on the first day of the Cork 20 rally. It's unbelievable uh, how good the stages are here. But so far, so good. A long, hard weekend. We'll be starting. So it's the Ballandangan, Ballywater and Shahana stages all over again. And this time Shahana is tackled in the reverse direction. 
Andrew loses five seconds to Frank at the first of the trio, but then proceeds to put the Tipperary driver firmly back in his box by taking the fastest times of the final two tests of the day to end up with a 25 second overnight advantage. But Frank is in fighting form as we can see here and determined to stop the Subaru steamroller on day two. Ian Greer and Dean Beckett should be happy with their first day in the new supercar. They're less than a minute behind the leader, just a puncher away, as we say in the business. There's bad news for the two top local drivers. O'Donovan will retire his Celica from fifth place with water injection problems. He was as high as fourth after a brilliant drive. And Franco Manning decides not to take the Impreza out on the second day after a piston problem recurs on his recently rebuilt engine. So the five Tarmac champions occupy the five top places in the five World Rally cars overnight. Day two on the Cork County Council and Rochestown Park Hotel supported Cork 20 Rally. The action moves west to the McCroom Mill Street area of this large county. No change up front, however, as Nesbitt and O'Brien's Subaru continues to dominate. The Impreza pulls seven seconds on stage nine and eight seconds on stage ten before their first visit to Mill Street's service. They've used racing slicks throughout the morning, and this is domination. Maher's hopes of challenging the Subaru are fading, as his 25-second deficit increases to 40 after the first two tests of the day. Frank admits to a few little sidesteps in the dance to Tipperary focus on the Shandangan stage. A bit of a twirl at the hairpin on stage 10. But the Clunny man has far from left the floor yet in his efforts to claim his second Cork victory. Ian Greer is back up to second, but now over for a minute and a half behind the leader. Watch this as he hand breaks the Corolla around the hairpin. Ian's times have dropped off a little as the team experiment with different suspension settings in their new car. However, with Austin and the other Corolla almost a minute and a half behind, there's no panic in the camp. And a K right, and a K left, line, medium right over Bry, 100. And here is the fourth place crew. Austin in the aircon net car is on the ragged edge as ever, but now trading times with his northern Toyota rival. And the team are about to make a discovery in the next service that will transform the tail-happy Toyota. Kenny McKinstry and Sean Mullally are much more competitive today, though Kenny's been off the road twice on stage 10. The British National Rally Champion is getting to know his new machine, and getting a little more used to left-hand drive. And McShay, who's giving Michael Orr one of the rides of his life, is keeping the fragile little 1600 Citroen together and holding on to that amazing sixth place. Here's another outstanding drive. Roy White is seventh and four and a half minutes ahead of his nearest Group N rival. Sean McCardle is eighth in the second Toronto de Paul entry. Corkman Liam Davis has differential problems in his Evo 4 and will slip behind Nigel Hickman's Evo 5 in the Group N battle. Then it's Welsh visitor Philip Morgan in another Evo 5. But sadly, Johnny O'Sullivan is now touring. He must finish to get that Yokohama Southern 4 crown. <laughs> From Mill Street, it's up into the Mushroomoor Mountains, where Stephen Murphy and a Yuha Kankinen look-alike have dropped in to catch the leading Subaru in full stretch. This is strictly for the brave. As Andrew accelerates through the fast right-hander, it's up into sixth and flat out well over 100 miles an hour for the whole way down the valley. And believe me, this is no motorway. Andrew is an amazing 23 seconds faster than anyone else on this barren test. And by the time he gets to Mill Street, he's over two minutes ahead. And the car behind is no longer a Ford. And he hopes that Frank may have had for a win in the focus are shattered by a puncture on stage 11. Now we're going for a cut there on that first stage out of service, but um. A tight left-hander with very small gravel on it, just the back of it stepped out, the tires were probably just a little bit too cold. And we hit a boulder and got a puncture, so we had to stop and change. It was a 14-mile stage, it was just too far to go. So, I mean, 
to either win or bust. So it looks like being a three manufacturer fight for the championship next year. Yeah, with Super Toyota and Ford, I suppose, and hopefully it'll be interesting and all the events will run as smooth as this one has run so far. In the meantime, the Greer Toyota is back into second place, and this is what it looks like on the, one of those long, frightening, flat-out straights from the inside. Quick right, 80, slowing for a turn, herpin left, travel. The Subaru may be out of reach, but while experimenting with the settings, Ian Cuddy and his men who run the Toyota have to keep a wary eye on Austin McHale's times, which have suddenly improved. And there's a very good reason for that improvement. A TTE mechanic from Germany has found a split wire leading to the differential and the repair has transformed the car. Ten, right. Austin explains. Left. Yeah, we're fairly happy now. We've had a problem uh, with the front diff and uh, apparently this has been maybe since around Donegal time that uh, this, we've had no front diff and you know it has really transformed the car. The car is handling excellent now and uh, I think over the last two stages the tyres have proven we're back up on the pace again you know so. Uh, I'm glad we found it really in a way because uh, I was feeling uh, a little bit uh, disappointed with the whole system and the way the car was to be getting beat as much as we were being beaten here and like I mean in Donegal there in June uh, we were 12 tenths just trying to stay with the, with the lads there you know so hopefully now this is the answer to the problem. Kenny is still making irritating errors he has had an overshoot in stage 12 and he's just under a minute behind Maher in fifth place no doubt slightly embarrassed as they all must be at the pace of McShay and here comes our hero at high revs after 13 tests, the two-wheel drive 1600cc Formula 2 car trails the World Rally Amada by just two seconds. It's a remarkable run. Sean Keenan in the kit car Corsa is second in Formula 2. Max McKillen will take the Toshiba Formula 2 crown despite a troubled run in Cork. And Barry Coleman's hopes of that title are dashed when he retires as escort Maxi. It's almost time to break up in the baguettes in the Nesbitt camp. It's uh, been a very good rally. There's three more stages left. Obviously the conditions have been very changeable. It's been wet and dry and underneath the trees there's quite a lot of mud and, and damp. So we, we, we have to be careful. Never a truer word has been spoken as Tag O'Connell's camera captures. We're on the Musher Amour stage again and Andrew nearly throws it all away. The manifold has gone before this incident causing the Subaru to be down on par. But amazingly, the WRC 2000 is still fastest over the stage. ProDrive points at the end of the stage to keep the leader in the event. Basically what we had to do was make a heat shield to give some protection to the drive shaft and the other parts under the car that are uh, vulnerable when the exhaust manifold cracks. It's not going to stop him finishing this rally in the present position. It's not going to stop him finishing the rally and I think uh, he should still have enough in hand to win the rally. Two stages to go as the rough sounding Impreza rejoins the fray. We catch up with the class winners. Paul Dempsey wins class one on his first rally. Kerry's Kevin O'Donoghue wins class seven. Class two goes to Cork's Ed O'Neill. Another Cork man, Aidan Long, wins class three in the rally and the Toshiba series. Johnny Sullivan struggles home in 14th place after a frustrating weekend to the Yokohama Southern Four Championship. And so to the top ten in the Cork 20 International Rally. Nigel Hicklin and Sam McMullen finished second in Group N and second in the Toshiba Series and indeed 10th overall. John Dempsey and Adrian Foley are ninth and could have been much higher but for that Stage 5 mistake. Sean McArdle and Paul McCann bring the Salika home in 8th place. Roy White and Des Cooney have the biggest win of their lives when the Clonmel Drivers wins Group N and is seventh overall. The heroes of the hour have to be Nal McShay and Michael Orr. 
the fact sheets read sixth overall, class six winners and Formula Two winners. But they don't portray the enjoyment that the Asquith team brought to the crowds in Cork and indeed to their amiable driver. Kenny McKinstry and Sean Mullally are fifth amongst the famous five after a difficult weekend struggling with left-hand drive. Frank Meyer and Dermot O'Gorman shouldn't be disappointed with fourth as they've shown that they are right on the pace in the focus. And we can now expect greater things from Austin McHale with the Corolla's differential intact. Joe Downey certainly enjoyed the experience. So whose hat is going to be in the ring for the Millennium Cork 20 Rally? Toyota or Subaru? I'm a Subaru man! <laughs> Has our Subaru man picked the right car this weekend? On stage 15, the Subaru sounds very sick. Ian Greer and Dean Beckett could get that hat trick yet. Last stage and the Toyota arrives ahead on the road. But the Subaru has too much in hand and Andrew and James win by exactly a minute and a half. It was dramatic, I can assure you. Done enough to win the rally? Well, we have to get to the finish ramp. So Andrew Nesbitt is truly the champion of champions in Cork. And the cross refrigeration team has set the yardstick for the 2001 Toshiba Tarmac Championship. And look at the final Toshiba tally. Andrew's four wins and the five events almost doubles the score of his nearest rival. But the modifieds are gleaming, especially Eugene Donnelly's G3 Escort. The Makara driver is the undisputed king of the category, and you can guarantee that this car, if it's still on the road, will be featuring in the overall top ten on Sunday evening. Tommy Randall's at Dayglow Dynamo will be upholding the honours of the South West in his hot rod, and so to the first day's action. Fortunately, Eugene speaks two dialects, Derry and Killarney, as his co-driver Paul Nagel comes from the opposite end of the country, and the multilingual combination proves to be devastating again, as they blitz the opposition on the opening test by 12 seconds. After two stages, they're 14 seconds up. Seamus Gallagher has purchased John Galise's national championship winning Escort Cosworth and he's using his four-wheel drive advantage to stay ahead of the more historic Mark IIs. Greg McCormick leads the Mark II brigade and gets fastest time on stage two. Then it's another Cosworth driven by Cork's Connor Kavanagh. But the local man hits problems on the second stage and drops to tenth. Another Cork Cosworth driver, Tim O'Reardon, is next up, and it's always good to book a grandstand seat for Kieran O'Neill. Our Daedlo Dynamo is never dull, but somehow Tommy and Dermot Lynch are not having a happy meal in their Mark II, and they will be an early retirement. Everything is going swimmingly aboard the Donnelly Escort, until stage four, when they break a brake caliper with obvious ill effects. The Murphy Motors car has been fastest on stage three, but drops a second to McCormick on stage four. Amazingly, here on five, they're again fastest, but it is a hairy ride. Despite that brake problem, they get to the end of this treacherous Marshallstown stage, seven seconds quicker than any of the other modified cars, and what's more, they're in ninth place overall. Sean Gallagher from Leitrim continues to shadow the G3 as he learns the potential of his powerful new Cosworth. 
Craig McCormick is having a ball. The Swatra driver bangs in another fastest time on stage four, pipping Donnelly by just one second. But he and Sean McGee drop 13 seconds to the G3 on the slippery Marshalls Town stage. Timothy O'Reardon, now up to fourth place, catches Galway's Michael Walsh on stage three. And Kieran O'Neill, well, what can we say? To the huge delight of the crowds, the Belfast lad is back at his sliding best. This is vintage stuff as Kieran opposite locks his trusty Vauxhall engine Opal around the county Cork countryside. Never has one car taken so much abuse for so long. Still, he and Dermot Fowley are fifth amongst the modifieds. Price and David Mooney are also in slide mode as they glide their Mark II along in sixth place. Donal O'Brien has a big moment here in his Mazda engine escort. He and Greg McCarthy are in seventh place after five stages. John Hickey and Paddy O'Callaghan are next up as we complete the second loop of the Saturday stages. It's back out into the Mitchellstown stages and Eugene Donnelly is again fastest in stages 6 and 7. 9 seconds up on 6 to McCormick and 11 seconds up on Gallagher in stage 7. Sean the Cosworth Novice is already over a minute behind in 2nd. And McCormick is 19 seconds behind in 3rd. Next up it's Timothy O'Reardon in the spluttering Sierra. They always say that the most frightening parts of a rally are the straights, especially the bumpy ones. That was the mother and father of all frights at over a hundred miles an hour. It's testament to Eugene's skill that they have survived with a blown tire, but in fact there is more damage than that. Done quite a bit of damage to the rear of the car, broke the two back shocks, got a puncture into the bargain. It was quite a scary moment as well. Went off in fifth gear like flat out. The rest of that Saturday stage has been the road to hell for Donnelly and Nagel as they limp off the stage and drop from eighth place overall in the rally to tenth. Sean Gallagher and Liam Costello inherit the modified lead and they have a 38 second advantage in their escort Cosworth over the following Mark II escort after eight stages. We're back on board with Donnelly and McCormick shoots past the stricken Donnelly escort into second. He will be 52 seconds ahead of the wounded G3 by the end of the day. But Kieran O'Neill is still fifth and lucky to be there. Here at Craig's Cross we witness an impossibly fast approach. Even a WRC car would have difficulty in stopping in that distance. Well, somebody could have opened the gate for him. morning and Donnelly's escort is now fully repaired and if the Makara driver can stay out of trouble, unlike this double O, he may be able to make up that 1 minute 12 second deficit to retake the modified lead. Sean Gallagher is enjoying his moment in the limelight, but he's not going to be pressured into any mistakes and he's taking his own time to learn the new car. Greg McCormick is really on the ragged edge. Just look at this replay from the curb camera. 
Oh, uh -oh steady up, Greg. It's spectacular stuff, but it's not producing the times. And the SDG trailer's car is beginning to sound rough. By Mill Street, Greg is out, and Eugene is back up to second. Eugene is on top form. Not easy when you've had a big scare. By Mill Street, they've pulled back 26 seconds on the Cosworth. Even the bovine residents seem to be of a fairly nervous disposition as the fourth place crew, Timothy O'Riordan and Don Montgomery, pass. John Hickey gets into a little trouble on stage 10 as Pat O'Sullivan's camera shows, dropping the Meath driver 10 places. Stage 11, Mushroomore Mountain, and Donnelly spies the modified leader, Sean Gallagher, ahead. This is not just for time on the road, this is for the lead of the Cork 20 National Rally. It's been a remarkable recovery. In the first three stages of the day, he's taken one minute, 14 seconds out of the leader to take back first place. So Donnelly dominates again, and with Greg McCormick retiring on stage 11, the status quo has been re-established at the top of the modified field. Timothy O'Riordan now moves up to third. And that good fellow here in O'Neill. Well, what can we say? He's certainly re-established himself as the entertainer this weekend. And the much-repaired Group Motors Works cadet is now up to fourth amongst the mods and rockers. Connor Kavanagh and James Jordan, now in fifth place, a brief visit to the bank here. But Parag Price, who's been in that position, will drop out of the event. It's been a mighty battle up there with the modified men. Yeah, it's been fast there, but we just backed off there the last while. But you don't stay ahead of Eugene Donnelly for too long on here because he's going very hard. Ah, in fairness to Sean, like he's he's uh, he's only out on it fairly new there, like so he hasn't a lot of experience with it, but he will get quicker, I'm sure. <laughs> but um all in all, like you know, the day has went brilliant for us. A real good crack at it. The first two stages this morning, we drove very, very hard. Like, and uh, all in all, it's, it's turned out pretty well for us. It's certainly been quite a turnaround, and so the final modified roll of honour reads: Paul Roberts and Pete Willoughby bring their Toyota up to the top five and win their class. Fintan Canty and Dennis O'Mahony win class ten and take an excellent fourth place. Kieran O'Neill sadly doesn't make it to the end as Tag O'Connell's camera captures, but a car can only take so much. Thanks anyway, Kieran, for the entertainment. Timothy O'Riordan and Don Montgomery get super value from their Super Tech Sierra to take third place. Sean Gallagher and Liam Costello are an excellent second, but it's been Eugene Donnelly and Paul Nagel's weekend. It's been brilliant today, we've had a good fight back today, everything's gone well, the car's going great again. Um, just nice to get back up there, get up to 7th overall. It's unfortunate that you still don't recognise us in this, but um, still we're there, I know, you know. 7th overall is pretty outstanding, isn't it? Well, I'm very pleased with it. Wicklow driver Lloyd Hutchinson in his mighty Mini leads the Toshiba Post Historic cars from the outset. Fifth overall and heading the historic entry is Philip Wiley in his MGB, who's followed by the 1999 historic champion Martin Boyle. And Danger Man does he not chases these two in his familiar 911. Day two, and Martin Freestone, who had led for a while, which paid to his chances with this incident, recorded by Bernard Downey's camera on stage 10. Although surprisingly, he does continue for a while. Hutchinson is back in the lead, but he retires the Cooper S on stage 13. Leaving John Farrell, navigated by his brother Christy, to take their first Toshiba post-historic win. 
In the historics, Desi Nutt and Geraldine McBride are now in a charge, moving to head the pre-1968 cars and to sit in second overall amongst the classic entries. Philip Wiley and Jim Howe come home third on the road and second in the historics. Then it's John Keatley and his longtime partner Morris Beckett, who are runners-up among the post-historics.